All right, kids, there you go. Teachers are in the back. Fly away, fly away, little birds. <laughs> I was walking by this cross here and I was thinking about the, the green, uh, which signifies ordinary time, and I was thinking of the irony of that, that ever since I gave my life to Jesus, there hasn't been very much that's been ordinary. But uh, anyway, for whatever that's worth. Uh, My name is Brad. If I haven't met you or don't know you, I think I know everybody that's in here this morning. So if you're visiting, welcome. And uh, it looks like it must be hunting season. Is it hunting season? <laughs> so uh, we've been going through the parables of Jesus uh, with an emphasis on what it means to abide, or to say it another way, to remain in Jesus or in God's love, life, and power. Uh, before Jesus' earthly death and resurrection, he often taught by using uh, rather enig uh, enigmatic little stories. Uh, this was to fulfill the prophecies from Isaiah 6, as Adam mentioned here a couple weeks back. In this way, he was able to keep certain mysteries obscured until the proper time to fully reveal them. At least that's one thought about that. So this morning, we're going to open up two parables Let's pray before we get into it, and I'll give you my best shot of that. Father, we thank you for the amazing truth, Lord, that we stand in your presence, that you're with us, among us, bringing life to us, filling our hearts with hope, making sense of the sufferings of this present world, giving us wisdom, Lord, to face the age that we exist in and live in. And we look forward to your completion of all things. But today, Lord, we break open your word, looking for nourishment, for encouragement. And pray, Father, that you will impress upon each one of us according to our need, something of life from your word. So we present ourselves to you because you have called us and loved us through Jesus. Amen. Uh, these two parables that we're going to look at today are found in Matthew. I'm going to be working from Matthew 13, uh, particularly verses 31 through 34, if you have Bibles with you. Most of the verses will be put up on the screen for you at the appropriate time. Uh, both of these have to do with the nature of the kingdom of God or of heaven. The kingdom of God, some of your versions might say kingdom of God. We might say kingdom of heaven. And the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is a place of God's dwelling. It's his space, his, his place. Wherever God is or whatever space that he has separated off from the earth, that is heaven. It's, it's not really, uh, it's here present among us, but it's also just, it's in the spiritual realm I don't know, like a veil maybe or something. That's the way I'm kind of viewing it. I'm not, I've kind of moved away from this idea of flittering up into a heavenly place. That, is, that doesn't really bring the weight to bear of what Jesus is talking about. And so when we talk about Eden, just to kind of give you a head up, when we talk about Eden and when I read some scriptures from Genesis, I want you to see that Eden was a place where God was present with Adam and so heaven and earth were together. And then by, through sin, there became a separation. And so Jesus is announcing a reconciliation of that. This coming together of these two dynamic thing, places. Man's space and God's space coming together. If you'll hold that in your mind as we go through this, I think some of this will make more sense. So both of these... Uh, Little parables that I'm going to read, I, I believe, whether I say it, I'll, I'll probably say it, but they're both grounded in hope. Uh, hope is essential for human wholeness. If you're hopeless, you're dead while you walk. When a person goes through 
such severe difficulty and sin takes its full course in their life where they become hopeless, oftentimes uh, they will move toward, uh, there's a spiritual suicide that happens that's usually followed by a physical one. When you think that things will never get better or things are random and have no, no purpose and no sense, then you're, you will find yourself in a state of hopelessness. We can all experience some level of that. I remember what it's like to be hopeless. I don't feel hopeless anymore. My life makes sense. I know that there's something in front of me that my life is not going to be today or tomorrow what it is today. And that's powerful in the human soul. It's something that's necessary for us when we go through really difficult things. We must have hope. And God is so great to give us this tremendous story and put hope in front of us. And Christian hope is the most powerful thing in the, <laughs> that we can really, you know, that we possibly can experience. And so when we listen to his word and we see where he's going and what he's doing, it's just like he brings light and illumination into all of the affairs of our life. Even if we're in very dark places, if we're going through really difficult times, we can, we can pause and we can contemplate the promise that he's had and we can begin to see our way out. I don't know how it was for you, but emotionally, early on in my faith, I felt really energized. But there came a time where all of a sudden, some of that emotion and sense of real closeness kind of ebbed back and I puzzled at it. Like, where, where are you? I, I, you know, in my youthful discipleship position or posture, if you will, it, it seemed like I've done something wrong maybe or something and God has drawn back. But that was, that's never true. That's never true. It was an emotional thing that I was experiencing and I wondered about it. And so I began to pray about that. God, have I offended you? Have I done something? Then God would just kind of, my emotional state would rise up and I would have that sense of his closeness and immediacy more. My awareness, it was all in me. The real truth is, is that he was never gone anywhere. I've heard people say, oh, I've, you know, God has left me. And I'm like, no, <laughs> he's closer than your breath. He just doesn't do that. That's just not true. And so anyway, hope is really essential for our wholeness. So the first, um, the first verse that I want to read is Matthew 13, 31, 32. And uh, this is found immediately following the parable of the really bad farmer that Adam so eloquently exegeted last week, borrowing from Michael Gatlin, uh, his, his idea of the parable of the really bad farmer that extravagantly throws seed everywhere. Well, today, we're going to go to the very next words of Jesus according to Matthew. It says, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed planted in a field. It's the smallest of all seeds, but it becomes the largest of garden plants. It grows into a tree and the birds come and make nests in its branches. And so the key words in the parable are seed or small seed, planted, becomes, and largest. Uh, to the hearers, uh, we're a little bit removed from some of these agricultural ideas, but to the hearers that Jesus was speaking to at that time, their life was immersed in this. Their very, their very uh, existence depended upon seeds and growing and food and you know we go down and just buy stuff at the supermarket we get a little bit removed from this stuff but if you grow a garden you you kind of get the idea you know if you're familiar with that you take a little seed have you ever thought about a seed I mean you take a seed like some of the seeds like I open up the pack I paid three dollars for and I'm like and I tear it all the way open and I find out there's just like <laughs> There's probably 50 of them, but they look more like dust got down in the bottom of the crease of the little pack. <laughs> I mean, they're really tiny, but you plant the things and they become really huge, a, a really huge plant. And so it, it, it's always a sense of wonder to me. And a seed, how does that work? You know, it's something, it's, it's, it's kind of, I mean, it's just, it has life in it. It has life in it somehow. And I think that's what... Jesus is pointing to. He's pointing to a seed. He's saying that the kingdom of heaven is like a, a farmer or a man who put a seed in the ground. It had life in it. 
And then it grows. And it gets large. And it becomes, Jesus says in this parable, the largest of the garden plants. So there's three things that I want to propose to you from this. Uh, it seems very simple and straightforward, but I want to try to open up the parable just a little bit to what was Jesus thinking or what may, might have been in his mind. Let's say it might be a little bit speculative, but I think you'll resonate with you what I'm going to say. Uh, the kingdom is a kingdom that prospers. It reproduces and it perseveres. All contained in a seed is the promise of, of new life again as the seed falls to the ground and, so, and comes up again. And so the kingdom of God is a kingdom that prospers, reproduces, and perseveres. In just a few verses, uh, let me try to support my statement. Let me remind you first that God finishes what he starts and means what he says. If we go back to the garden, we find Adam with God before Eve. And the, uh, Genesis 1, Genesis 2 is kind of two counts of creation story. Uh, they tell different things. And if we go to Genesis uh, 2, I'm just going to read it from here and draw a few things out. Two verse 18 through 20 is what I'm going to read to you. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. So the Lord God formed from the ground all the wild animals, all the birds of the sky. He, he brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And the man chose a name for each one. He gave names to all the livestock, all the birds of the sky, and all the wild animals. But still there was no helper just right for him. And so <laughs> here we have, it seems in this story that... Um, it happens before. Uh, it happens before the creation of Eve, and so in the story, what we have is we have God has made Adam, and there's a period, must be a period of time uh, where the Lord is with Adam. And to me, when I read it, I can't get past the idea that that God is fathering Adam. He's got him out there and he's got all these animals. I mean, he says he's going to make a helper. It's not good he's going to make a helper. But then he talks about animals and naming animals. And so here's Adam is in this mentoring, fathering type of situation where God has created the animals, bringing them to him. And he and Adam are naming the, the animals together. And Adam is growing in awareness that there's not a suitable um, counterpart to himself. And so you see how God speaks this word and then he's drawing it out of Adam. He's bringing Adam into this revelation. I mean, he could just do the stuff and not include Adam, but he includes Adam. That's the point I want to draw out of this. So if we go back up to verse 28 in chapter 1, which is the first story of creation, it says, and God blessed them, the two of them, or in 27, let me start there. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and govern it. So then down in chapter 2, we have this process. It's like we go back and get the prequel, and we get Adam being mentored by God into coming into a place of, of understanding or a, a, like, an, I don't know, like an epiphany or something. And so, so then God goes on. He says, he caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while the man slept, the Lord God took one of his ribs out. He closed up the opening. And then the Lord God made a woman from the rib and brought her to the man. At last the man exclaimed, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken from man. And so what we have is God created man in his image. We learned in chapter one. Uh, and so the functional purpose of that, of being God's image, it, it's, it's not... 
it's not that you uh, do things. It's what you're made. It's what you're made. It's it, it's like there's a functional purpose to being the image of God. We're made as a perfect counterpart for God in what His purpose is. What God wants when He made the creation is a family for Himself, and so He set the creation up to speak and to bring the heavenly truths to bear down into the temporal realm and so that everything that is created and all things that are made and all the things that men do speak of God's glory. They point to something that God is doing, something that he uh, intends to accomplish. It reveals his divine nature and his glory. And so if we look at it that way, God's establishing Adam's created purpose as an image bearer to reflect the glory of God, his ways and purposes. Here God is speaking through Adam. I hope I've made that clear. He's speaking through Adam, revealing something about his desires and motives. He is desiring a family. Eve is the perfect soil, if you will, for Adam's seed. Now Adam uh, is enabled to fulfill the command to be fruitful and multiply. The command of God and the desire of God cannot be completed by Adam alone. And so the things that God is doing in his creation is, I think there's, a, there's, a, there's a, another tier of reflection. This, this is reflecting God's desire. The reason he created is that he had a desire to express himself, to build a family. <laughs> And so we, we have this creation and he's utilizing that and he's using men and women to do that. And so he's showing us all of the truths of the kingdom right through this creation story and all of the history and all the sufferings. Everything falls into this category of God revealing himself to his creation and bringing to fruition his original intent and desire. We kind of know that but we don't stop and think about it too often. So you can see the natural project of God reflects the true kingdom that Jesus is excited about bringing about in our parables. God himself is taking Adam's place. That's what he's preparing to do. Jesus is coming, and we know that Adam was the natural man, fell short of the glory of God. Now Jesus is coming and is going to image the true man, according to Hebrews in the first chapter. He is, the divine, he is the exact representation of the divine majesty on high. Jesus comes as a perfect image bearer. So both in the natural and the spiritual realms, the respective kingdoms prosper, reproduce, and persevere. So the first parable, this little seed that grows into the ground, goes into the ground and begins a plant and the plant contains within itself the ability of perpetuity. It prospers. The seed prospers. The seed endures. The seed produces and reproduces. Okay. So in John 12, 23... I'm going to have to look that one up. I guess I don't have it. In John chapter 12, verse 23, Jesus says, um, now Jesus replied, let me read it right off of here. Jesus replied, now the time has come for the Son of Man to enter into his glory. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it remains alone, but its death will produce many new Kernels, a plentiful harvest of, the, of new lives. Okay? The uncontainable, incomprehensible creator has prepared a human body in Jesus to serve as seed for the creation of a whole new kind of humanity. A single human body is a pretty small seed in the scheme of things. But Jesus is saying that small seed will become the largest of the garden plants, and if you're listening to the echoes of what the scriptures are saying, everything is, is about Eden. 
where God, heaven and earth were together in Eden. And so God's plan is the reconciliation of heaven and earth. Our prayers, our songs, everything we're singing about this morning, it's all about that. And Jesus is in that process of making that happen, bring it to fruition. So he is saying that his body is going to be the seed. It's gonna go down into the earth and it's gonna begin to produce and it's gonna become the largest of the garden plants. In Eden, the largest of the garden plants is the tree of life. So Jesus is just saying a few words. Well, the kingdom of heaven is like a seed, a little mustard seed goes in the ground and becomes the largest of plants. It's, the mystery of it is somewhat hidden. <laughs> but now we know. We see the rest of the story. Hope is the vehicle that carries us to the power of that truth. <laughs> I love this. To sum up the first passage, Jesus says the kingdom will have a small beginning, a weak and struggling start, the first blade of growth being the apostles, just a few humans with nothing more than a story, but the story is infused with divine power. We now stand somewhere in the timeline of that continuing growth. We are in the process of the plant becoming a tree. Already, the people of God provide rest and shelter. Our little parable said that it becomes a tree where the birds nest in it, in their shade, and find rest in their shade. So the birds find rest and repose. And Jesus is referring to those, uh, that's exactly what we are as the church. We provide a place of rest and shelter for the world. The kingdom of heaven, Jesus with us, the fullness of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. That's what we do. And as we believe, that becomes effectual. It becomes truthful. It becomes a testimony to the world. The parable grows. It just keeps growing and becoming more powerful. I don't think it's overreaching to see echoes of this larger truth in our individual lives. We start out this life of faith in a pretty small way. The scriptures tell us don't despise the day of small beginnings. No matter how small your faith is, it's going to grow and become a place of shelter, healing, and comfort to those around you if you will remain true and keep your eyes focused upon Jesus. This seed has life in it. His life and your life together have power and you will become a place of refuge, comfort, and healing to the people around us. Think of that when we multiply it by the whole room. Yeah, come on. I, okay, maybe I've said enough about this one. We start this life out of faith in a pretty small way, but as we abide in the truth, the grace of God produces fruit. We find the influence uh, we wield much more effective and far-reaching than we think. It's this, the presence of the inerrant life of the seed that's planted in us that bears the fruit. All we have to do is receive. Just receive. That's it. We don't struggle. We just receive. Matthew 13, 33 says this. This is our second parable. He also used this illustration. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman used in making bread. Uh, even though she put only a little yeast in the three measures of flour, it permeated every part of the dough. I want to clarify, it is yeast. That's not a bad translation. Most translations say leaven. What leaven is, just to kind of build on this story, what leaven is, is a little bit of the dough of the previous day's bread or bread couple of days back. That's what leaven is. It's just, they would make bread, they would leaven it, then they would save a piece. Then they would bring more flour and add the leaven to it. The yeast was already working in the leaven, which is, I think is kind of important and we could miss because, see here again, we're thinking we go down and buy a, a package and I'll put it in a little water and, and wait till it to boil and then we put it in the bread, but it isn't the way it was for them. And so to get the depth of the meaning, I think we need to understand a few things like that. 
Now, we can have some, our second passage can afford a few interesting thoughts. First, the first observance is pretty straightforward. You take some flour, you add leaven, you mix it up, you wait for the yeast to perform its, uh, to perform uh, its um, changing or mixing or corrupting the loaf, and then you bake it, and you get this wonderful, is there anything that smells better than fresh homemade bread? I don't think there is. It's wonderful. And then you get to eat it, and it gives you life. It's cool. I mean, it's, it's cool. It's the very basic staple of the first century people that Jesus is speaking to. Bread is, it, it's, it's a symbolic, or at least they understand it as an all-encompassing word of their basic sustenance. They can't live without it. At a deeper level, one might intuit that adding a lively element to an inert material introduces a multiplication of life. Jesus is definitely pointing to this truth. He intends to add life to the loaf, so to speak. At the same time, to the astute listener, he uses three measures. The use of three measures in the phrasing echoes or calls to mind the stories found in Genesis 18.6. So, you know... I don't know if you've figured that out yet, but when Jesus chooses words and says them, they mean something. It's always more than what you think. And so he says, take three measures. It's like a woman who took measure, three measures of wheat. And if you go back to Genesis 18, 6, you'll see the story of Abraham where all of a sudden he sees the Lord coming with a couple of angels. He turns around and he hollers at Sarai, Sarai, take three measures of meal and go bake some bread. And so, that motion of Abraham preparing those loaves and extending hospitality and invitation to the Lord, it becomes its act of worship. It's an act of worship, okay? And so, he chooses three measures to show you that he's speaking about, he wants, he wants the hearers. They would know this story. This would be as popular to them is what common stories we have. And so they would understand when he said three measures, they would instantly go to these different places in the Old Testament scripture, stories that they had where bread was made and offered as worship before the Lord. It happens with Abraham. It happens with Gideon. It happens with uh, Manoah. It happens several places in the Old Scripture, in the Old Testament scriptures. And so it's an act of worship. You'll see why I point this out in just a minute. I would like to venture from the simple point of the parable that he's making a loaf, and so it's his life going into this loaf. This is, I mean, on the basic level of why Jesus is saying it, they're picking up that leaven, this life thing, is added into this broken flour, and it's going to produce something that's going to give life. They would pick that right up. But let's, let's just for fun... Dig into the flower a little bit. Now, when I started writing this, I had visions of doing one of my little, uh, I used to like to do demonstrations. So I didn't know, I didn't have a grist mill, so I thought, well, maybe I could bring a Vitamix. And, and you know, that'll grind wheat. And I was going to go get a couple of heads of, of, of the wheat so you could kind of see them, but you're going to have to use your imagination because I didn't do any of this. And so anyway, here's, the, here's how flour happens. When we say flour, we think $1.59 gets you five pounds of flour at Albertsons. Or maybe, it might be $5.59 now. It used to be $1.59. But anyway, you go down, you buy a bag of flour. Flour doesn't mean too much to us. White stuff, get a cup of it and throw it in. But flour to these ancients was a whole different thing. First, they had to go out and they had to scratch the earth. They had to scar up the earth. Then they had to put some seeds in there. Then they had to hope and pray that the rain would come and the wheat would grow. And when the wheat did finally grow, they would go out and they would hack it down with, with big scythes. They would pull it down, put it into sheaves and let it dry. Then they had to take it to a winnowing floor 
or a threshing floor. And that was usually a little kind of a structure that had doors on both sides and it would, they would face it. For us, it would be west to east because during the harvest time, our winds come out, prevail out of the west. And so what we'd do is we'd build a platform and then what we'd do is we'd take those sheaves and we'd lay them out on the floor and then we would go to work beating them with the flail, which would be a, like a stick with a, something like cords or leather something, you know, and it would be like a, you know, like a long nunchuck or something. And what they'd do is they'd stand there and they'd whap on that wheat. And then it would knock the shaft loose from the kernels. It would beat the, the stalks up, break it all up. It's, it's a nasty job It's because it's hot and dusty. And then the wind would blow because after they got done flailing on it, somebody would put a winnowing fork under it and throw it up in the air and they keep tossing it up and then the wind would blow all the chaff away. Now they end up with a little tight kernel. So let me read Matthew 13, 11, 12 for you real quick. John the Baptist is talking. He says, I baptize, baptize with water those who repent of their sins and turn to God. But someone is coming soon who is greater than I am so much greater that I am not worthy even to be his slave and carry his sandals. But he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. He is ready to separate the chaff from the wheat with his winnowing fork in hand. Uh, then he will clean up the threshing area, gathering the wheat into his barn but burning the shaft with never-ending fire. I think I'm moving out of this internet scene here. I'm pushing this podium for him. So we see Jesus connecting this process of making the bread, and there is some suffering that's involved for the wheat. If you're a stalk of wheat minding your own business out in the field, your life is about to look terrible for a while. <laughs> but so, so anyway, you take the kernels, and you break them down into powder for better blending. If you've ever ate, have any of you ever ate wheat pudding? No hands? Yeah. It's the only thing on my scale of unfavorable things. It goes right below grits. <laughs> but bread is right at the top. So a little grinding remedies the problem between <laughs> wheat pudding <laughs> <laughs> or wheat salad, some people call it wheat salad. It's just soaked wheat where it gets all swollen up like puffed wheat, you know. It's just, oh, it's gross stuff. So you break the kernels down to powder and they're better for blending and for consuming. Are you hearing me? The ground and the grain are afflicted, so to speak. The presence of sin in our world causes us to be exposed to affliction on a constant basis. You cannot get away from it. Our world is subjected to futility in the natural realm. The power of the kingdom of God coming in is the only thing that I'm aware of that can make sense of the sufferings and affliction and futility. It can overturn it and cause it to work for good. Affliction is a terrible thing to endure. We don't like it. Jesus told us that we would have tribulation in the world, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. John 16, Jesus said it is possible for us to experience peace even in the midst of affliction. It's possible to derive meaning and a good purpose from the experience of affliction. Listen to this verse, 2 Corinthians 4, uh, 6 through 18. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay, to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifest in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, 
so that the life of Jesus also may be manifest in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? This is a parable about hope. If you don't have hope, you do despair. You do experience forsakenness. You do experience being struck down and destroyed. But not for us. Not for us who have put our faith in the living seed of God that can never be destroyed. We are the leavened loaf, if you will. So we have the same spirit of faith according to what has been written. I believed and so I spoke. We also believe and so we also speak. Knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. For it, for it is all for your sake so that as grace extends more and to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this momentary light affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that, we are, that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, means passing away or temporary. But the things that are unseen are eternal. When we respond in faith to the afflictions that truly come upon our lives, the glory of God is seen in us. We don't see it, we see the pain, we feel the pain. We feel the threshing, we feel all of the difficulty of it. But what happens is there's an aroma that's being let out. Jesus said, I will baptize with fire. When he brings the fire into the church, there is an aroma of the presence of God upon us. When we actually do the things, when work through the, when we're, all we're doing is just fighting about our fights, what's that? That, that, you know, we're just processing problems and walking away. Well, I'm going through some struggles and nobody cares about me. You know, or, they're not doing it my way or whatever. We're having, we're suffering some struggle. We're suffering some affliction. Might be from ignorance, could be, I mean, most of my wounds, I don't know how yours are, most of my wounds were self-afflicted. <laughs> That's a good way. I mean, I don't need nobody to beat me up. I'm good at it. Affliction, though, facilitates brokenness. I gotta, I gotta move right along here. Affliction facilitates brokenness, and brokenness leads to humility. Humility receives grace. If the impenetrable hard shell of, our, of the kernel represents our isolating ego of pride, and pride prevents grace, by God's wisdom, we must be broken through exposure to affliction. Oh, yes. This is not lightweight stuff. I'm sorry, it, it's really not, but this is the truth. This is the truth. When we stand in the place of faith, we are more than overcomers. Our hope carries us through all these difficulties and we in turn learn to help our brothers and sisters along, sharing our story, speaking our words, sharing our experiences of victories and the work of God in our life. It, it's so important. By God's wisdom, we must be broken through exposure to affliction. In the verse above, in verse 17 that I read, Paul brings forth the fact that our hope is the weapon we are given to overcome whatever adversity we encounter. Our parable gives us hope. When we enter into the life that God has given us and participate with him, he fills our life and our heart with hope. And we don't look at this sad world with despair. No. The world was falling apart for contractors around here in 2007. I went down to, I, I never realized it before, how much, how, you know, because I just thought people were tired of me. They would duck out and get away because don't make eye contact with me because I love to talk. And so I go down into the Sherwin Williams store and there's a whole bunch of people in there and the news has come that there's just going to be a crash and all their work is going to go away. They're pretty anxious. And all I did was, they, they all kind of looked at me and I thought, how strange. And I said, don't get afraid, don't worry. I said, it's going to be a little tough for a couple of years, but it's going to be fine. 
They were thinking the world was coming to an end back in 2007. It's way worse now. That was, what, 15 years ago. I mean, we didn't fall over dead, you know. Don't worry. I mean, I like to tease Adam, you know. Sometimes, a couple times I've said this, and he's downstairs so I can talk about him. But uh, I said, how's things going? And he's maybe having a difficult week. And I go, oh, hey, don't worry about a thing. It's going to get way worse than this. I can say that with a smile and we can get a laugh because we know. We know. Yeah, we can overcome all this stuff. If we persevere, that's what the parable, the first parable is about, perseverance. If we persevere, don't ever jump the fence. Stay in the hand of God, no matter how painful it is. Learn to become honest and to share your load with those around you. And all of us can do work, do well to attend heartily to our discipleship to learn how to help. <laughs> All right? Our parable gives us hope. The life of God is folded in to the harvested and processed and prepared lives of kingdom people. Jesus, the bread of life, is represented here by the leaven, the portion from the previous loaf. He transforms us into a new loaf of life-giving bread. He is the first one to go into the ground. He is the bread of life. But there's a transgenerational nature to that. He has now entered into our lives and we have become a new loaf of bread of life. He transforms us into the new loaf of life-giving bread. The church exists for the life of the world. As Paul so deftly states in Romans chapter 8, verses 16 through 23, for his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children, and since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share his glory, we must also share his sufferings. Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal in us later. For all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are. Against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse. But with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. Oh, what a day that'll be. When the sons and daughters of glory are revealed, broad daylight. We believers also groan, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of our future glory, for we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. We too wait in eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as his adopted children, including the new bodies he has promised us. What a word. Abiding in Christ means remaining in the power of his love, patience, waiting on the Father to complete his work, to bring his promise can be emotionally trying. Patience and waiting on the Father to complete his work, to bring his promises can be emotionally trying. But the seed he has planted in you and I will come to fruition. He starts what he, he finishes what he starts. I could quote scriptures here, but time prohibits. Hope produces endurance. Affliction and suffering are as sure as the sunrise in this world. No matter how dark the times or painful the circumstances, hope lays a hold of the power of God's love and faithfulness, and his presence leads us to overcoming victory. We live in the tension of this kingdom, already present yet not yet complete. This is the war cry of the vineyard. Already, not yet. And we live in that tension, seizing every opportunity for God's glory to break out now, for the kingdom to break forth into our world through our sufferings and through our victories, to feed the world, to be an aroma unto God. Hope lays hold of the power of God's love and faithfulness, and his presence leads us to overcoming victory. We live in the tension of the kingdom, already present yet not complete, as bread given for the life of the world. And uh, that's all I got to say about that. Two parables. <laughs> as Jenna comes and uh, we'll have a prayer, a prayer people up here, we'll be waiting. If you need prayer, please during this time of worship, come forward. Uh, 
if you're struggling in affliction, God spoke to you in any way, and maybe you feel in hopeless, anything like that, if you need prayer, please come and get prayer. Don't put it off. We actually want to participate in these things of the kingdom. With that, I'm out of here. God bless you.